Good morning, and welcome to Grace Baptist Church. We are so glad you've chosen to worship with us this morning. We just want to take a few minutes to let you know about some things going on in the church. The Attic Outlet is having a food drive that runs through May the 6th. Each family is encouraged to give. You can check out the insert in your worship guide to find out what types of food are needed. There will also be an Attic Outlet work day on May the 5th from 9 to 1. On May the 5th, we'll be having our men's breakfast at 7 a.m. This will be hosted by guest speaker Johnny Hand, who is the worship leader at Cowan First Baptist Church. Join us on May the 5th for our men's breakfast at 7 a.m. There will be a child dedication service on May 13th in the 11 a.m. service. Please contact Melinda Brown for more information, number listed below. On May the 6th, we have a couple of different things coming up. It's our next new members class at 9.45 a.m. And then May the 6th, Sunday night, we will be having a special worship service at Mount Zion Baptist Church. So we'll be leading worship and Brother Tim will be speaking. There will be a meal at 6 o'clock and the service is at 7. Join us for this special service on May the 6th at 7 p.m. We are so glad you've chosen to worship with us this morning. If you're joining us for the first time, look under the seat in front of you, take a card, fill it out, and place it in the offering plate. We are so glad you've chosen to worship with us this morning at Grace Baptist Church. Whether you've been here your whole life or this is your first time, we are absolutely thrilled that you're here. We hope you have an amazing morning here at Grace Baptist Church. And we are expecting God to do amazing things today. So let's seek Him with all of our hearts and, and know that He's going to move in our lives this, door, this day. Let's stand, please. Our God is mighty to save. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. find me all my fears and failures fill my life again I give myself to follow everything I believe in now I surrender Savior he can move the
God, we thank you that we get to come to a place like this and just lift high the name of Jesus. God, because you came to this earth, you died on the cross, put in a tomb, but in all three days, God, you conquered death. God, because you are the author of our salvation, we give you praise here this morning because you are mighty to save. So God, that is the, if that is the only thing you've ever done for us, you are worthy of the praise that's going to come from our mouth this morning. But God, I pray that this is not just a, a one-time moment, that it's something that just happens on Sundays, but God, we are continually, praise is dripping from our lips all throughout the week. But God, as we are here this morning, fill this place with your presence. God, I pray that, that everybody that walks in these doors, they, they know that they're walking into the presence of God because you are all over this building. So God, move, speak here today. Have your way and speak your words into our life. And it's in that precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, guys. You can be seated. Man, we're so excited that you're here this morning. If you are a guest with us for the first time this morning, man, we're honored that you have chosen to be a part of us here this morning. Right at the end of the service, if you would walk right out these little side doors right here, take a right, and our pastor and the deacon of wheat will be there just to kind of meet you and shake your hand, those kind of things, all right? Let me a couple of things that are coming up this week that you need to know about tonight. Let me remind you as we finish up the Vertical Church series, um, this week, tonight, we'll be talking about uh, um, unafraid witnessing. And so what does it mean to be able to share our faith with people? And so be here tonight and, and be a part of that. Also, I remind you, you heard in the video that it said baby dedication is going to be May 13th. We're moving that up one week. So next week, um, May 6th, will be our baby dedication. Um, our, our pastor and his wife have decided they're going to go to Texas in, on Mother's Day and be with uh, Margo as, as they're doing a baby dedication there as well. So I think they've earned that right, being great grandparents is what they need to do, right? So they're going to go and be a part of that. So we're going to move ours up. Wait, 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 wait. Let's correct that. We're not great grandparents. I know, right? That, 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 we that's are, kind of funny. <laughs> we are. We are awesome grandparents. Uh, <laughs> that, I did come out kind of funny, didn't it? Maybe, maybe we were talking about Kim, right? No, sorry, sorry. Just, just, I'll be in trouble for that one later. So, man, we're, but we're so excited you guys are here. Remember, next week, if you have a baby that's going to be dedicated on 13th, get back uh, with Melinda and, and kind of move that as we do that next week, okay? Um, also, let me get, remind you a couple of things. We're getting into the graduation season. Um, we have about 13 uh, high school graduates that are going to be graduating uh, uh, this year. So, but if you know of anyone who is going to be graduating from, from college or things like that that we may not know about, if you could write that little note, drop it in the offering plate, they'll get it to me, or send me an email at matt at, in, at graceintelahoma.com, and that way we can honor them. That, that service is going to be on May the 20th. Um, we're going to honor our, our graduates on that day, high school and college. So if you know someone, let me know. Speaking of that, really quickly, um, with 13 graduates, what we're going to do, we're going to do something a little different this year. Um, we're going to adopt a program, and it's called Adopt a Grad. What that means is we're looking for 13 families or more. We can adopt them as many times as we need to. But over here in the next couple of weeks, you're going to see a table set out here in the front. And it kind of looks like that Compassion International table where it says adopt this child. We're going to do an adopt a grad. All right. You'll see little profile pictures and all that kind of stuff. They're filling information out for you. What we want you to do is we want you to adopt that student. Here's what it looks like. You'll adopt this student. Let's just say, um, let's say, for instance, it's Logan Burton. He's not graduating, but I just saw him. He's the first person I saw when I looked out. All right. So Logan's information would be right there. You would see that in, in every information there, and you'll send him. You'll pray for him throughout the year. You'll also look at some things. There'll be some, what's his favorite food or some kind of gift card. You can, so care package, you can mail to them at college. Just a way to let these students know that they're graduating out of high school and going on to the next part of their life, but they still have a church family here who is praying for them, loving on them, and it's always going to be here for them. So it's a way for us to kind of reach out and, and love on these students a little bit, okay? So 
That'll be coming soon, so don't be surprised when you see it show up. I didn't want to shock you, all right? So that's going to be coming up for us pretty soon. So, man, we're excited you're here. Brother Tim's make one quick announcement, and then we'll shake hands. Philippians uh, chapter 1, the third verse says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine making requests for you with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Fifth Sundays, we always take that opportunity to recognize somebody special that means so much to the church. It's not because they want to be in front of people, not because they want to get accolades and uh, get a praise, but uh, just to show you who they are so that you can have opportunity to show your appreciation to them. This person today that we want to recognize does so much behind the scenes. And I know that this person's going to kill me for doing this today, but uh, the personnel team, along with myself, chose this person to recognize. Uh, this person is involved in uh, keeping up the vans. Uh, this person uh, does all kinds of fix-it jobs around here, repair jobs. This person built these beautiful steps. This person built this beautiful uh, a new member station, the greeter station out there in the hall. And I want you to join me as we recognize Charles Waller. Charles, would you come forward? Let me come to him, and y'all can turn around. He had to leave. He had an accident the other day, uh, just which I think is very uh, indicative of who he is. He was helping pull somebody out of the ditch, and the um, cable broke off of the the. Um, that they were trying to pull him out, and it wrapped around his leg, almost cut his leg off. And so he was back there, but she said, uh, Miss Annetta said that he had to leave because his leg was hurting. Uh, he's very lucky that it didn't cut his leg off. If it hit him anywhere else, it probably could have killed him. But that he was serving somebody outside the church there, helping pull somebody out of a ditch. And so we're going to ask that you will see him and show your appreciation to him later because he had to slip away. Only uh, Miss Annetta and uh, his son Aaron are back there. And so we apologize that he had to leave, but do take time to thank him, okay? I want to ask all of you to stand and, and uh, greet one another right now.
I appreciate so much the, uh, the combined choirs together. Uh, the kids' choir, the, the Jubilee Choir, is getting ready for their musical on May 30th. So make sure that, that everybody's aware of that. It's going to be a great time. Uh, they're going to have practice this afternoon and, and next Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock, so, um, in addition to the Wednesday night rehearsal. So just be aware of that, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So thanks again. Give them all another hand just as they go off the stage there. Thank you. A stingy miser worked hard all of his life, making lots of money, and he very rarely spent a dime. And on his deathbed, he said to his wife, he said, promise me that you'll put all of my money in the casket with me. I'm going to take it with, the, with me to the afterlife. She promised him. A few days later, he passed away, and there she was seated in black, wearing black, on the, seated on the front row at the funeral with her best friend right beside her. Just before they closed the casket, the wife went forward and placed a box in the casket with her deceased husband. The wife's friend grabbed her by the sleeve and said, please tell me, please tell me that you didn't put all his money in there with him. And the wife said, yes, I, I did. I made him a promise. I'm a Christian. I made that promise. I don't break promises. He asked me to, and I did. Her best friend said, you mean to tell me that you actually put all of his money in there with him? And the wife said, I sure did. I wrote him a check for the full amount. <laughs> in the first part of Acts chapter 4, we considered the courage that the Holy Spirit gave to these early believers so that they could be witnesses of the gospel, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now today, we want to turn our attention and we want to consider the generosity that the Holy Spirit had given these believers so they could be a blessing to each other. The courage the disciples displayed and the generosity they demonstrated is phenomenal. It was just remarkable, the courage and the generosity they had. George MacDonald wrote, much of the misery in the world comes from trying to look instead of trying to be what one is not. Now let that kind of soak in for a moment. Hang that on the clothesline. Let the Holy Spirit just kind of blow on that for a moment. Let me say it again. Much of the misery in the world comes from trying to look instead of trying to be what one is not. These early believers did not desire to look like Christians. They wanted to be Christians. Now, of course, what a Christian is and what a church is on the outside is very important. We ought to be concerned about our image. We ought to be concerned how we, we appear in public, uh, our dress, our actions, uh, our reactions, uh, the, the, the testimony that we render to those on the outside. We ought to be concerned about that. But the effectiveness of our testimony and the witness of our church is not dependent upon what's on the outside. It is dependent upon what's on the inside in our heart and in the heart of other believers. And so this morning we're going to take a look at the inside. We're going to go inside the early church and we're going to look at a snapshot of the early church. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn with me to Acts chapter 4. And we are beginning our study today in verse 32. Acts chapter 4 and verse 32. The first thing I want you to see this morning is that the uh, church was multiplied. Notice the first three words of verse 32. Now the multitude. Now do you remember a few weeks ago when they had Pentecost and we were talking about Pentecost and they, there was a group of about 120 believers that had gotten together and they were praying for the Holy Spirit to come down and uh, they had a great... Uh, they had a great harvest of souls. Many people were added to the church and to the kingdom that day. Well, th this early movement has gone from about 120 people to an excess of 5,000 people. The church has grown phenomenally. The reason for, for this is the followers of Christ believe each one should reach one. Evangelism was their daily ministry. It was the, the delight of the entire congregation. They didn't just say, you are apostles, you're paid to do this, you do the evangelizing. We'll sit back and cheer you on. We'll sit back and, and, and watch you and, and, and applaud for you, but you do it all. No, they all were involved in this. They felt everyone in their city needed to hear the good news of the gospel. 
Do you feel that everyone in our city needs to hear the good news of the gospel? I, I, I imagine that most of you would say yes, but judging by many of your actions, you say no. Because when it comes time for outreach and we ask you to come help us do this or that or when it time, comes time for us to ask for money to meet this need for this project or whatever, you say no with your actions. Your actions speak louder than your words. Do you really feel like the entire city of Tullahoma needs to hear the good news of the gospel? These people felt that all of Jerusalem needed to hear the good news. So we see that the church was multiplied. Now the multitude. Then we see the church was unified. Notice verse 32, the next words there. It says, they were of one heart and one soul. What a beautiful picture of a church that is on the same page together. Now, no wonder they did great things. No wonder their number was grew phenomenally. No wonder it was said of them later on that these people turned the world upside down. Folks, when God's people get together, it is amazing what a church can do. Can I get a witness? If you take a, uh, if you take a group of Christians who are always griping and complaining and fussing and fighting with one another, you couldn't build an outhouse with that group of people. But you take a group of people who are in love with the Lord, who are on fire for Jesus, who doesn't care who gets the credit, who are willing to do anything and everything it takes to win people to the Lord, and you'll see a church that's on the move. You'll see God doing some miraculous things. You'll see God moving, and you'll see miracles of all kinds performed for God on this earth. This church was unified. Now, there. first of all, let me tell you how it was unified. First of all, there was a unity of, ex of experience here. Notice verse 32. Now, the multitude of those, help me out, church, who what? Believed. The multitude of those who believe. Now, there are several titles used for Christians or for believers, followers of Christ in the, er in the early days. Most common term that we use today is Christian. But the word Christian only appears twice in the New Testament. So there were some other expressions that they used to refer to followers of Christ. Sometimes they used uh, the expression, those of the way. You'll see that in Scripture from time to time. Sometimes they were referred to as the family of God. Sometimes they were referred to as the brothers and sisters of Christ. But here they were identified as believers, those who believe. You see, a church is made of people who have had a common experience. A church is made up of people who have had a personal saving experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. They have by faith trusted Jesus with their heart. We, we, we're all different. We like different teams. We like different foods. We got different personalities. We come from different backgrounds. We live in different areas of town. But the one thing that brings us together is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the common experience because I've trusted Christ because you've trusted Christ because you've trusted Christ. We are brothers and sisters in the faith. Amen? Doesn't matter what background you are. Doesn't matter what kind of salary you make. Doesn't matter what color your skin is. Doesn't matter what side of the track you're from. The common experience is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness. Now, brothers and sisters, there's a difference in believing in your head and believing in your heart. Did you know that? I'm sure all of you in this room today believe in your head that Jesus actually lived, that Jesus uh, was born uh, in a manger, that Jesus uh, was born of a virgin, that Jesus lived a sinless life, that Jesus died on a cross, that three days later he rose from the dead, and that one of these days he's going to come back again because he's there in heaven, but he's going to come back and collect all of his church, all of the body of believers, and we're going to go spend eternity with him in heaven. I believe that all of you believe that in your head. But do you believe that in your heart? You see, you can believe all those things in your head and still die and go to hell. The Bible says even the demons, even the devil and the demons believe. Believe up here, don't they? But they don't believe down here. I want to ask you this morning, have you by faith 
trusted Jesus with your heart? Do you believe it here? I'm convinced that there are going to be some people who are going to miss heaven by 18 inches because the belief is here and not here. They're going to miss heaven by 18 inches. Listen, if you've never opened up your heart and invited Jesus in, I hope that you'll do that when I give the invitation this morning. When I close in prayer and I step down here and invite you to come, I hope that you'll come forward and say, I want to trust Jesus in my heart today. These were believers. They were unified because of an experience. They had all trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior. And then there was a unity of expression. Now I want you to understand the leaders of the early church were poor fishermen from the despised province of Galilee. And the mass converts of Jerusalem, at least at first, were very poor people. The the persecution arose and the people that were committing their life to Christ uh, were, were kind of from the poor area there. And so there was all kinds of financial disparity. There was kind of hardships that were uh, caused because of their decision to follow Christ. Many young Christians were fired from their jobs. When their employers found out that they were going to trust Christ, they were fired from their jobs. Some were ostracized from their families. Christian renters were kicked out of their house. Christian-owned businesses were boycotted. You say, oh, that's kind of far-fetched. No, it's not. Go to Taiwan, and you'll see that same thing happening for those people that choose to follow Christ. When we went over there, it's a, it's a huge decision for them to follow Christ because their families will turn on them. They might lose their job. They might, they might actually get kicked out of their apartment because the, the way of Christ is not the way in Taiwan. And so the, because of all this, the, the believers in Jerusalem were having a hard time. They, they, weren't make, they were having a difficult time meeting uh, making ends meet. They were, they were tough. Things were tough financially. So notice what it says in verse 32. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. In other words, these Christians didn't think anything or believe anything belonged to them. They knew it all belonged to God. And some of you this morning say, oh, I own a lot of property. I own a lot of... No, you don't. You're just a stewardship. You're just a steward of that. God owns it all. Because that piece of land is going to be here long after you're gone. God owns the earth and all the fullness thereof in it. You're just a stewardship for it while you're here on you're just a steward here while you're here on this earth with that piece of land or that boat or that house or that car or that whatever. So these believers didn't believe anything owned to them. Uh, belonged to them, it belonged to Christ. Now here's what it says in verse 34. Nor Was there anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each as anyone had need. In other words, they shared everything they had with each other. Their motto was, what's mine is yours. Now, there was no command in Scripture from, of God against owning property. There's nothing wrong with owning property. There's nothing wrong with owning material things. There's nothing wrong with having money. These people were willingly giving their property and what they had because they had an intense responsibility for each other. They thought it was unthinkable to have too much while somebody else had too little. And this sharing was not the result of legislation. Nobody was commanded to do any of this. It was strictly voluntary as the Holy Spirit moved them. It is not when the law compels us to share and give, but it is when the heart moves to share and give that society really becomes Christian. See, I, I, I can make you feel bad today. I can give you a big sob story, and, and you could feel compelled and feel guilted into giving, but that doesn't truly mean you're generous, does it? When the Holy Spirit gets hold of your heart, you, you're, you're generous. You, you, you will start making sacrifices and sharing with people beyond your wildest imagination. 
There was also a unity of evangelism because notice verse 33. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. There was power and there was grace. Earth-shaking events were taking place. People were getting saved left and right. The desire to see others saved was of such importance that these believers didn't mind sharing what they had and giving whatever it took to see people saved. My brothers and sisters, if you and I will be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ, and be willing to share what God has blessed us with and do whatever it takes to see people saved, God will pour His power and His grace upon us in astounding ways and we'll see miracles that you've never seen before in your life. And then we see the church magnified. The church had a winsome attractiveness about it. Back in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, it says they had favor with all the people. That means all kinds of people from all walks of life, from all economic brackets, were flocking to this church from all over the place. A church alive is worth the what? Drive. Back in those days, a church alive was worth the walk, right? They had no cars. Their services were so packed you couldn't get people in with a shoehorn. They were facing opposition from the rulers, but yet in spite of that opposition, the church was growing by leaps and bounds. People were being drawn to this church because something new and exciting was happening. Don't you wish that would happen here at Grace Baptist Church? Somebody say amen. Amen. We bang our heads against the wall. We can't even get our own people to come fill the church. How are we going to get others to come fill the church? When we are so lackluster and unfaithful ourselves, wouldn't it be awesome that people would just be drawn to this church like a magnet because something exciting is happening here? Finally, we see the church exemplified. Luke ends chapter 4 by telling us about a Christian named Barnabas. Barnabas was an example of the kind of believer the early church was producing. He was indicative of, uh, he was exhibit A. He was indicative of the kind of member these people were seeing and the church was producing. The Holy Spirit was raising up. Now, you do know that a church is made up of people. Amen? A church is not a building. You remember this little thing? uh, uh, Here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door, and here's the what? The people, right? A church is people. A church is, exists for people. See, we're in the people business here. We're here to win people. We're here to grow people. We're here to mature people. We're here to encourage people. We're here to help people. And that's why every decision that we make, we need to ask ourselves these questions. Will it win somebody to the Lord? How will it help people grow and mature in the Lord? Is what we're about to do going to be encouraging and be a help to people? We're in the people business. And the purpose of the church is to exist for people. But I want you to understand that the purpose of the church is not for entertainment. Though it ought to be entertaining to go to church. I don't think it ought to be boring. I don't think you, you ought to uh, have to be drugged to church. I don't think a worship service ought to be like a funeral. Amen? Amen. We don't come to, to mourn a dead Savior. We come to hell a resurrected King. And, and so it ought to be entertaining to come to church. But entertainment's not the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is not to elevate your intellect, though it is very educating to go to church and to study the Bible, to study the Scriptures and to memorize Scriptures and to learn. But that's not the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is not to improve you culturally, though I think it is important to learn some social graces and learn how to become a Christian gentleman and a Christian lady. Can I get a witness? But the purpose of the church is not to improve you culturally. The purpose of the church is to help men and women, boys and girls, become like Jesus. To make disciples, right? And so Luke gives us an example of a Christian who was like Jesus. Look at verse 36. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement. In other words, we're told about a Christian here whose nickname is Mr. Encouragement. What's your nickname around the church? Oh, you got one. I've given you one or somebody's given you one. If you ask me, I can probably tell you what your nickname is. What's your nickname around the church? Is it Harold Hypocrite? Everybody knows Harold Hypocrite, don't they? Harold Hypocrite sings louder than everybody else. He prays the longest. He makes sure everybody sees him at every event. But he's a hypocrite. He cusses on the job. He gets drunk on the weekends. He's a mockery to the Lord Jesus Christ. He brings reproach upon the church. Is it worldly Wilma? 
It doesn't matter what the Bible teaches, what the preacher preaches, what the standards of Christ-like conduct are. Whatever the world says, Wilma's going to do. Is your nickname Gary Griper? You know Gary Griper, don't you? He gripes about everything, the songs, the programs, the bulletins, the temperature of the church, the length of the sermon, how the church spends its money. You name it, he gripes about it. Is it high maintenance Henry? High maintenance Henry is the one who takes the preacher and the staff's time all the time. He just has to have every minute of their time. Everything is a crisis. He's got to call 15 times a day. He's got to ask you to be here. He's got to do this. Got to take your time before church. Got to take your time after church. He is high maintenance Henry. Is it negative Nancy? You know negative Nancy, don't you? Negative Nancy is so critical. She's always fussing about something. She's like a fly in the ointment. She's that one bad apple in the whole barrel trying to spoil the whole barrel with her negativity. Is your nickname Greta Gossip? Greta Gossip is always spreading stuff even when she doesn't know what she's talking about. Now, here's how Greta does it, okay? She will come under the disguise of a prayer request. Here's what she'll say. She'll come up and say, we need to pray for so-and-so because this is what I heard about them. That's not a prayer request. That's a gossip, isn't it? Is it Greta Gossip? Is your nickname Greta Gossip? Oh, Lord, here comes Greta Gossip. Maybe your nickname is Prideful Polly. You know Prideful Polly. She's Miss Big Shot around the church. Look at me. My husband's a deacon. I think I own the place. Maybe you're Re- Re- Rebellious Ralph. Rebellious Ralph is a teenager. His mama makes him come to church, and when he gets big, he says, I ain't going to church no more. Yeah, Ralph, mama made you take a bath too, and I guess when you get grown, you won't take a bath anymore and stink up the world. Amen? What's your nickname around the church? You got one. People know you by something. I'm thankful for prayerful Pam. She prays every day for her church and her pastor. I'm thankful for friendly Fletcher. He's the one that makes everybody feel welcome, especially those that are visiting. He goes to them and gives them a warm handshake or a hug and a smile. I praise God for generous Gene. He is so unselfish and so generous. Whenever there is a need, he cheerfully, cheerfully gives to meet that need. I'm thankful for hospitable Helen. She takes meals to those who are sick, prepares meals for those who have had babies, gives meals to those who have lost loved ones, and she always is willing to open up her home to evangelists, traveling singers, and guests. And then there's faithful Frank. Faithful Frank may not be the most gifted individual. He may not be the most well-to-do person. He may not be the richest person. But when the doors are open, faithful Frank is always there. You can count on Frank. He is faithful to his Lord. He's faithful to his church. And he's faithful to the Word of God. I thank God for serving Sally. If there's a job that needs to be done, serving Sally will step up and volunteer and make sure that job gets done. And then there's consecrated Carol. She's totally completed completely committed her life to the Lord Jesus Christ. She sold out from top to bottom. And then there's Fix It Fred. Something needs to be fixed around the church. You just call Fix It Fred, and, and as John Deere says, he'll get her done. I mean, he'll get it done. He loves to serve his Lord and serve his church by fixing things. Whether what, It doesn't matter what it is. I'm glad to serve. I'll be there to fix that in no time. What's your church nickname? Barnabas was known as Mr. Encourager. Uh, Let me ask you this, friends. Wouldn't you like to be the kind of Christian that when people get around you, they go away saying, man, they're so refreshing. They're They're such a blessing. Wouldn't you rather have that said about you than somebody say, oh, they're such a burden. Oh, they're such a burr in my saddle. Oh, they just drive me crazy. Wouldn't you rather be a blessing to somebody than a burden? Barnabas is mentioned 25 times in the book of Acts and five times in the epistles. And every time that Barnabas is mentioned, you can check it out for yourself. I checked it out. He's giving. He's helping. He's ministering. He's affirming. He's encouraging. He's uplifting. He's bringing out the best in people. 30 times his name is mentioned in Scripture, and every time he's doing something that builds others up. And notice what he did here in verse 37. He didn't do this for himself, but he did this as an example. 
having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. In other words, he set an example of generosity. He set an example of generosity. My mind goes immediately to Bob Williamson. Bob Williamson has gone on to be with the Lord. Many of you remember Bob. He was a deacon. He was our Sunday school director for some time. Bob came to me one day, and he said, I got a truck I want to give to the church. I said, what, is it? what, 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 what are we going to do with the truck? He said, I want you to park it out front, sell it, and I want you to put, use the money for the church, for the building fund. That's the kind of person that Barnabas was. Franklin Graham said, if you have anything you cannot live without, give it away. Anything that's too valuable to give to the Lord reflects the poverty of the owner's soul. Over in Acts chapter 9, verse 26, we're told about the conversion of Saul. And at first, everybody was afraid of Saul because they knew he was a bad dude, right? They knew about his path. They knew that he had been persecuting Christians, that he had been killing Christians, that he had been trying to stop the Christianity movement there. But it was Barnabas who brought Paul and introduced him to the disciples with his arm around him. And he said, I vouch for him. I verify his ministry. He is the true blue. In Acts chapter 11, Barnabas ministered to the Greek converts in the city of Antioch. In Acts chapter 11, verse 30, he helped the poor in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 2, he went with Paul on his first missionary journey. In Acts 15, verse 36, we're told that Paul had a difference with a young man by the name of John Mark. And it was Barnabas who was willing to give John Mark a second chance. He said, if Paul won't take you and give you a second chance... You go with me, I'll give you a second chance. Every time we see Barnabas, he's doing something to bring out the best in others. Only the indwelling Holy Spirit can produce such an encouraging, affirming Christian as Barnabas. Barnabas just had that knack for bringing out the best in people. Wouldn't you like to be a Christian like Barnabas? Wouldn't you like to be the kind of person that, uh, that people rush up to instead of run away from? Anybody get my drift? When you see them coming, oh, Lord. Oh, gosh, here they come. Oh, uh, wouldn't, you just be, wouldn't you like to be a magnet where people just run up to you instead of they run from you? Let's strive to be like Barnabas. Let's be men and women who point others to Christ instead of turning others away from Christ. I wonder this morning, do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? If not, would you come now and allow me to introduce you to him? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Father God, we have heard... Your word, we know that faith comes by hearing and the hearing comes by the preaching of your word. And faith takes place when we move in our hearts, not in our heads. And so I wonder today, Lord, if there's any man, woman, boy or girl in this room that believes it up here but doesn't believe it down here. And if so, would you... Move that belief 18 inches down to the heart and let them come forward today and profess Christ as their Lord and Savior. If there's anyone here today, Lord, that desires to join the church or be baptized, I pray that you will give them the courage and the sense of urgency to do that while they have the opportunity. The majority of us here today are already believers. We've already committed our hearts to the Lord. We've already desire, made our desire known to follow Christ. And The question is, are we a blessing or a burden to people? Are we pointing others to Christ or turning people away from Christ? Holy Spirit, search our hearts. Let us see if there's any wicked way, any bad attitude any hypocritical action that we need to confess today so that we can be a magnet, so that we can be a drawing card, so that we can be an arrow that points to you. Lord, may our commitment this morning be what we're about to sing. I give you my heart. 
I give you my heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand with me. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. All I have within me, I give. moment I'm away, Lord, have your way in me, Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. This is my desire to honor you. Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. All I have within me, I give.
I uh, had an, uh, an unwelcome visitor recently and uh, probably more aptly put, an invader called uh, pneumonia. And those of you that prayed for me, sent me cards, visited me, I just want to thank you. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for the promises that you have made to us that you would never leave us alone or forsake us. We just ask you to uh, continue your watch care over our lives. Bless as we serve. We thank you for each gift and each giver today in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want more happy than your heart will hold If you want to stand taller if the truth were told Take whatever you have and give it away If you want less lonely and a lot more fun And deep satisfaction when the day is done Hey 
God's people said. Amen. Y'all be seated for just a moment. Uh, I want to introduce to you those that have made decisions this morning. Uh, it's been exciting uh, to be in the house of the Lord. What a great way to end the service. Don't y'all agree? Y'all did an excellent job, guys. Our men's ensemble, I think we need to hear more from them. They were really good. Uh, and what a great exclamation point on the message today. I want to ask uh, these three to come join me here uh, to my right. And if y'all would all come stand here, and I want to introduce them to you, uh, beginning uh, the most nearest to me uh, and then to the furthest away there. First, I have Eller, Eller Bryan. Uh, Eller is uh, coming today to move her membership on promise of letter from Rutledge Falls Baptist Church with a church receiver by saying amen. 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 Second from my right here is uh, Michael Acuff, and uh, he desires membership in the church today by statement. Uh, he's uh, been out of church for the last several years, but he has uh, told me that he has professed Christ in the past, been baptized. He wants to unite with us today as well. Would you accept him likewise? And furthest from me is Miss Eva Metz. Uh, this is uh, Melinda's mother. She just relocated here uh, to, um, to Tullahoma from Decatur. She wants to come today by way of letter from Central Baptist Church, Decatur, Alabama. And she also rededicates her life. So would y'all receive her today? And Matt, she is the great grandmother. Okay. <laughs> right. And Charles, would you come stand here? Charles had to leave earlier. His leg oh, wow. was hurting, but he is back. Uh, and I want y'all to now, together, join me in showing your appreciation to our serving friend. Hey, we love you. God bless you. That guy right there, he's the fix-it Fred, okay? He's fix-it Fred. So be sure to speak to him as well as these three. Uh, it's been a great day. Hope you have a good afternoon. I hope you'll come back tonight at 6 o'clock. Definitely plan on being with us uh, next Sunday night at Mount Zion. We're going to have a great time in the Lord worshiping together. It will be a ball. It will be a blast. So, uh, guys, can you all take us out on that? Yeah, and, and if you're a guest, uh, Tim's going to be right out the door there. Get out of here. Uh, and uh, uh, if you, if you want to speak to Tim and, uh, and, and Brother Charles, uh, if you're a guest, come check them out there just a second. And uh, say hello to each other. Don't leave just yet. Just say hello to some folks, all right? Here we go. Don't listen to us. Just, just visit a little bit. <laughs>